most people who are in prison are from the poorer backgrounds or have mental illness. Mm. So, or have fucked up lives. Yeah. So that's kind of says it. It's like you don't really get the 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 the, the privileged, well educated middle classes mm. going to prison. But there some of them are just as criminal. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Yo, it don't get better than this, uh, especially unprecedented. I did well. We, we were set, but for fuck's sake, I'm very excited we were here. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast live and direct. Central London or central as you need to be. Share and care that, yeah? Pass the word around. Spread it. Spread it. Um, big up graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight, everyone, with the Kellervision app. Um, getting involved. Lots of new things on the way, that's for sure. Um, and uh, to... Uh, uh, hold true to that. We do have a gentleman that's inside the place. Hey, hey, fucking hey. Uh, legendary in the early 80s graffiti. Moving on swiftly into a music career that uh, we're going to dive into. On equal measure, the legends, the people that create the street culture that we absorb and take in like it was regular regular content online this is one of the men that was doing it from the jump it goes by the name of coma what are you saying my brother nice to meet you keller it's hard to put you into uh, put it into context when you think about the uh, the way the world is now to how it first began with the world of street culture huh yeah i mean things are a lot different now than when we were doing graph i guess <laughs> but it's good that people are still interested in the history yeah. so that's why i'm here i guess super yeah. excited you're here brother like the, the, the fault lines, again, like, big shout out to everybody from back in the day. There's a lot of youngsters that are here as well. And it's just super important that we get deep into this sort of conversation. And also the music side of what you're about. Like, right, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of people, graffiti is a, the, the conduit, the, the first entry point into what becomes their creative path. Exactly. I mean, it, with graf- the, the thing with graffiti, it gives you this kind of do-it-yourself you know, like punk or yeah. hip hop, I guess. It's like I can, I don't need anyone else. I can go and do, create myself yeah, 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 and yeah. do it on my own terms and, and that independence. And I, I carried that along, that attitude of from graph into the music. Um, I guess with hardcore and drum and bass and those guys, they, and, and grime, it, they, they had the same, it's the same ethos of having, Doing everything yourself, starting your own label, mm. no bullshit from the majors, no answering to anyone, yeah, 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 yeah. just putting your shit out there yeah. on your own terms kind of thing. And that attitude, I think, I got from Graf. Yeah. yeah. Hip-hop came as like a super package, wasn't it? It was like one of those... Beforehand, yeah, there was that the punk thing, but, 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 but hip-hop allowed that cheap, uh, cheap to enter kind of attitude of like oh they're doing it we can do it like really we, we can do it i guess so um i guess we looked at what was happening with uh what we what came before mm. because with, with the with the uk with london anyway there was a the, there was a, a punk influence to the to the graph mm. so like the clash mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. Uh, the clash brought Futura over and he did the first piece in, in Grove. And big up Scam as well at that point as well. Big he up was Scam. <laughs> Ooh, Link, I think he, he had a tag on there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but before that, Labrick Grove w- had this history of like anarchists and counterculture. Mm. And there was this group of anarchists called King Mob. That So it wasn't hip hop. They used to, on the track sides, they do graph along the track sides. What? So it was more like political and social and really anarchistic. And there's a, there's a book called The Writing on the Wall about 70s graph in the UK, in London. I know of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm aware of this. And the King Mob, they wrote, I think it was, it was 
under the Westway on the Met on the little Met line uh-huh. all along the trackside saying, uh, "Work, eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep." That kind of you're in a rat race, kind observational of thing. kind yeah, of graph observational. Sort of thing. So oh. Grove has got a history of graph B before hip hop, and that kind of and it was it was straight. It was just coincidental that Futura. The Clash were from Grove, mm. and then they they um, they got Futura. They brought Futura over uh-huh. on tour with them, and he did that piece there. Mind blowing! And then that became the mecca for a lot of writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Under the Westway, so the punk there is a punk connection. There is, and yeah. also there's a especially with Grove as well. And this is something that we, we kind of brought up with Scams podcast. Um, it was it was almost like the, the the Young Turks. It was almost like the new hipsters. They were they were there, and there was bands like, or um, well, Motorhead was, was Hawkwind, was Hawkwind yeah. things like that, which I've always found like endearing. It, it was almost like what Old Street is now, I guess. It was Bohemian. Bohemian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was this place where it was kind of arty and edgy, but it 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 wasn't moneyed. It was still a, a slum, mm-hmm. like. Some part, I mean, Scam used to tell me how, how Power Square used to Power be Square, like rough. Yeah. As it, and like the, the front line, All Saints Road, mm. even when we were doing graph, it was a no-go area. Really? Kind of thing. Yeah. Talk to me about that. So what, what was it like? What well, was I, it never even, like? I never even ventured down there. But I had family in Bayswater, the posh like the rich bit, right, right. So, so, so we had a we we had a, an embassy back over but, elsewhere. <laughs> but he, but my gran moved to Bayswater in the late in the sixties, mm. and so it wasn't particularly rich. She rented a a, a place there, mm. so it was like a family home. We used to go at the weekends, and so then I'd wander down to Labour Grove, and that's how I got to meet the Grove lot because wow. I'm from I grew up in Wembley originally. North Weezy, hold tight, North Weezy crew, you know what it is. But we didn't. I mean, there were there were gangs. There was a gang called Tape Tone, who used to trouble the writers and rob the writers. What uh, that weren't into graph like that. They were no, just troubling them. They were just a part of a. Maybe they were part of a bigger gang. I'm not sure. I thought they might be related to a sound system or something. But people like the the real Grove, lot like Scam hmm. and Hate and Foam, they hmm. they would know more about that. I was kind of part time Grove, I think, and Tape Tone. I mean, I got robbed by Tape Tone. Hate did. Even I think even Foam did. Really? But they, they were, they were, they were. I think they thought of writers as just idiots, and they were. They, I, I think they went on to be like proper serious criminals. Really? But that it was, it was a bit edgy and a bit dangerous. Some parts and mm. some parts I wouldn't go down All Saints Road or anything like that. You know what's interesting about the, and this is only through conversations that I've had. I wasn't there, you understand. You know, I'm, I'm speaking through God knows how many episodes, but I do feel like there was a, when when imported in hip hop was such a culture shock. They just thought, oh, these guys are just idiots. Really? Like, or yeah. well, they're just running around paint, painting their name everywhere. Really? They're not doing. Yeah. Well, what's the point of that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it is true. It's quite a self-serving art form, isn't graffiti? It's quite self-serving in a way. Yeah. It's there's no there's no money but there's no reward financial yeah. reward. Yeah. It's like you're not you're you're just doing this for some kind of outlet, creative outlet. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So I mean, when hip hop came here, I think it it identified with a lot of people from all different backgrounds. It was mm. such a it was like a craze, mm. a big a massive movement that came over in the eighties. The videos mm. like the, the book Subway Art, Style Wars. Here, have all of this now. Go and do it. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and 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 I think we've. I think people who like from all different national nationalities and ethnic backgrounds. Yeah, identified with it, which is not like other youth cultures mm, before. No. Really, it brought different people together. Like writers they were from all. You had. Really rich yeah. writers. You had people from the roughest housing estates and everyone in between, kind of thing. Yeah. So there was nothing, no other youth movement like that that was no. just so diverse and different racial backgrounds: yeah. black, white, Indian, Chinese, all, all, all together. It's funny. I measure a lot of my movements on that, and and the thing is, with with graph, like you say, it's all about the tenacity. Bring it, bring it. 
how far can you get up? It don't matter. We don't even want to see your face. <laughs> we want to see you up. That's it. It was about how, yeah, have you got the skills? Yeah. Or are you all city? Can you bomb and can you peace? Kind of thing. Yeah. I guess they call it a meritocracy. A meritocracy. The, 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 the talent, the real talent does... Rise to the top. Oh and God! You've just given me a new word. You watch this. Meritocracy. It's going to be on, <laughs> it's going to be on all the podcasts moving forward now. <laughs> meritocracy. You see, you are. <laughs> it's wicked. Does yeah. it? Does it blow your mind? The idea of um, starting so so young in the game. And bear in mind, we're only talking about like what between eighty four and eighty six. What? No, when I started. Th- I mean, I started doing outlines and stuff in in about eighty four, but probably. 85 when I actually first went out there and did God, pieces. Yeah. God, so yeah. the first train was in 1985, I wow. did. And then I stopped in I stopped in 1988, my last train. Last train in 88? 88. 88 with hate, yeah. It's bonkers when you think about it. Um, and I might have done it. I did a few little record covers and stuff after that, but nothing illegal. Hmm. Because I, uh, I mean, I've probably said this on other things, but... I got sent, We well, me and Tilt were the first to get sent to prison for it in 86. Mm-hmm. And then we got done again, a whole load of us in, uh, well, we got arrested in 88, but the court case didn't come up till 1989. And by that time I'd stopped. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other story about getting into the acid house and music taking over. Mm. Oh, we'll get into that. <laughs> but... <laughs> But yeah, but I'm, I mean, I I got into graph by going to New York as well. So I went to New York in '85 right. with my brother because I had family over there. I saw the tail end of it. I saw the graffiti on the trains. I saw pieces by a guy called Cast, not the Cast here. No, 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 no. Yeah, those wow. and a few others. And I saw quick throw ups and scene throw ups in the flesh. In the flesh, like. Seen uh, and PJ along the highway, along the motorway, from the airport into the city. Oh, I know the one. I think it's, oh, I could be wrong, but Rock Creek Park, mate. That Maybe. Might, as yeah, you're going, yeah, yeah, you're coming yeah. in, you'll sit, because I did that trip and I saw these things on the yeah. side of the, yeah. you kind of feel like you're going into, the, driving into the projects like that, right? Yeah. And then uh, a Zephyr tag. Mm. So I witnessed the end of it. And then when you went, and then we went to uh, the Fresh Festival, so it was like a hip hop jam yeah, yeah, yeah. in um, Queens, I think. And it was LL Cool J was the first one on. No one had heard of him, or he'd just done a, uh, the first album or something. And then Houdini, Fat Boys, and then Run DMC headlined, and and they're all in their prime. Yeah, this was that uh, peak. Yeah. What was the audience like? It was bonkers. I guess it was pretty much mainly a black audience from whatever, from mm. New York. Yeah, yeah. New York black but audience. packed, packed out. Packed, yeah, mad. yeah. Like, <sighs> I don't know, thousands of people. It's so hard to comprehend because you... It's just a given, isn't it? And it, It's just a given that hip-hop is the way it is now. Yeah, but this was the beginning. So when, when you go through something like that at that age, you came back here and it's like, well, I've... Got to carry that on somehow. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I've got. I bought all this. I bought my hip hop clobber. I've got at least whole tree. It's yeah, funny. yeah. I did buy all the clobber as well. <laughs> like name belts, like puma joints, the suede pumas with fat laces, two tone jeans. Yeah, it must have been like night and day. You leaving and coming back. <laughs> but um, but at, it was kind of at the same time. Over here was just after electro, so. Uh, hip hop was kind of the music was getting big. Mm. We just like the graph people were just starting to get into graph. So yeah, it was the beginnings really here. Yeah, and like we were saying just just prior to this, it was it's almost like such a small condensed time. You were absolutely kinging it in in every sense. You were actually you know um, I don't know like criminal damage set free foam hey like you say um, oh jeez I mean the list goes on like. Hit and run, like these were kind of like era defining, era defining artists that you were kind of mixing and ma- matching with. Well, yeah, but at, we didn't realize that at the time. It was just the beginning, and it was just a movement that had never happened before. And and a lot of people in London were into it. There were a lot of writers. Was like, it like was it like a, a kind of 
influx where there'd be just everyone would have a tag, everyone would have a name? Uh, well, not everyone, but probably more than there's ever been, I, I think. Yeah. Hundreds, hundreds and really? hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know. It's like a phase. From all over London. Really? We're just writing, yeah. And it, no one would, no one at the time, you're not going to think this this is something cool mm. and unique. But when looking back on it, it's cool it was and like unique. the beginnings of a youth culture that didn't exist over here before. Yeah. So, and yeah. It's, it's often the biggest question I think people pose from the outside looking in is why would you do something that you don't make money off of and is dangerous? And, but that's like the purest form of art. Well, that's itself. it. It's like yeah. you're risking your life and your freedom for something that's not making any money. But at that age, it was about the buzz. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fun, the buzz of it. And for some people like me, it was like an, in, an alternative family or an, a way of getting identity, mm. um, validation from peers mm. that, you, that you need, that you weren't getting kind mm. of thing. Mm. So you wouldn't... Yeah, I mean, a lot of writers I know, a lot of the Grove writers were from uh, fucked up households or one-parent families and stuff right. like that. But then again, the people from Harrow were a bit more suburban, but they were just as hardcore. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. like, yeah. It was a real variety. I don't know. I think it was just a, a trend. And a, a, as teens, you're just going along with what all your other teen friends are doing in it. It just yeah. all came together, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I can't believe that it's still going now. <laughs> I mean, I see trains are still being done. Trust me. Yeah. Trust me. And you were saying at the start, like the moment you stopped. Actually, let's not go. Let's not go here just yet, because okay. I, I, I kind of yeah. want to. I kind of want to just to touch on a few extra subjects. Um, the fan in me is coming out, guys, as, as I'm sure it is with you. G give me, give me examples of. When you were out, for instance, with, with tilt or foam or, you know, some of those classic pieces, kind of those classic moments. Because I'm asking you this because m most of the time, it, again, it's just a given. But you were learning as you kind of went. There was elements of like yeah. this had never... So talk to me about those, that, I guess that process back in the one, day. The, the, the one kind of famous thing I remember was when we went to Rickmansworth Yard for the first time. So it, there was tilt... Me tilt cast. Um, I can't remember who else. There was a guy called Mac one, mm. and another guy called Jest from Harrow. But there were they must have been about ten of us. But I can't remember the other guys. Ten of you. Yeah. That shit sounds scary, bro. Like I know yeah. Excel mentioned this that you guys just all rolled in like you were like firm, <laughs> like you were the firm. But, but but we thought the trains parked up at Watford. We were just learning, so mm. we got the last train to Watford. And then got off, got out of the station, waited around, waited around. It's what you do. Mm. And then kind of looked at the sidings or, or the layups. Mm. No trains. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they didn't park them up there. So what we had to do, we had to get back onto the lines. We walked all the way down the lines. And it, there's a junction where it one it goes off uh, going towards Rickmansworth. Right. And we knew there was a yard in Rickmansworth. Chrome Angels, I think, did Rickmansworth the first, but I'm not sure who'd been there before. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us had actually been there before. So we all walked down the lines, and there was a hut just before you get to the yard, mm -hmm. a workman's hut. And so in order to kill some times, we, 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 we couldn't get in there till about one or two mm -hmm. because there'd be cleaners, workmen. Yeah, yeah. So we'd wait in the hut. So and I think Tilt had some music and some speed as well. I didn't take any speed, but we were kind of listening to music in the yard, in the, in 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 this workman's hut before we went in. Then we went in Rickmansworth. It was fine. There was no one in there. There was about five trains all parked up. Um, this guy Mac. There was a light flashing just on and off on and off and mac was like yo tilt i've timed the light and it's going on and off every five seconds Tilt just looked at him and goes shut up you plonker <laughs> speed talking <laughs> yeah, there yeah, yeah what are you about? <laughs> and so it was fine we just painted it all did our pieces i haven't got any pictures of it i don't i don't think anyone we didn't no one took photos there and then that much 
back then. You'd yeah, have to carry a that? camera. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's just another thing that you don't need. To carry, it? yeah. So most people didn't take photos of, in the yards. What was it like when... Because you weren't... Obviously, the paint compared to now, back then, was a whole lot different as well. What was the cans? What, you, what, were, what, were the, what was the weapons? I mean, the best paint was Bundlack, obviously. Of course, yeah. But it was the hardest to get. Um... Like by chance, there was a art where art, there was like an industrial estate where I lived around the corner in Wembley, and they there was an art kind of shop there, mm. and they had Buntlack in there. So it, Bunt, there was Buntlack around the corner from where I lived. So I used to go in there, pretend I was some art student with a portfolio, load it up with Buntlacks, yeah, 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 and yeah. that way. But then my mate Reem, who I used to paint with, he went in there and in, and we. We just make we hotted it up. Hotted up, yeah. You went in too hot. So so it didn't last long. But Buntlack was obviously the best paint. Always used hammerite black for outlines. Mm-hmm. I think because the way it came out and the thickness of it and it stained, it always stained the train quite quite hard. So even after it's still yeah. The, yeah. So when they buff it, it still shows through. I, lo- um, I love that look, though. I do love that the buff look. look. Yeah, I love the buff look yeah. as well. There's something about it, just knowing that the the scent's still there. You know. Yeah. When seeing it. Yeah, ghosts. Yeah, They're ghosts. Like ghosts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and hammerite white for outline. There were beltons. Were quite good paint. Um, were they easy to get beltons? I, I I don't, quite hard. Only a couple of shops, I think. Mm. A couple of car shops. Beltons. There was mm. a shop in Holloway Road. I think they sold beltons. <laughs> But people like Hate used to go to Amsterdam and get this paint, Spava. Big up Hate. Big up Hate, yeah. Um, and people used to, yeah, they used to, uh, get, we, we used to go on missions out, out of London. Mm-hmm. So we'd call them plots. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we'd have plots in, say, Maidenhead or where they're a bit more clueless. They wouldn't think, oh, people are doing graffiti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. we'd have to go out of London. So you'd bunk the train go to Maidenhead, find the art shops and stuff, get loads and loads of paint. But then we got we became good at racking. So we'd be getting jeans or mm. Walkmans and food and drink and it was it was like a way of life. Racking all day and then painting in, in the night. I can't imagine you being <clears throat> criminally Mind minded, I mean, and I say this to most graffiti writers that come on because you know times change and things move, and obviously this is just one sample of your career trajectory. Yeah, it was I don't know three or four years yeah. of, but it's that adolescent time as well when yeah. you're. I can't imagine now running off a platform down the lines. I don't know if I could do that. But then it was just like nothing. Do you it even was, see it as part of your timeline at all? Do, yeah, because it it's you so can influential. It. You can you can picture yourself it's, doing it, but you can't imagine doing it literally. Yeah, I mean, I at that age as well, you're wild. You mm. you you take risks. You've got all that testosterone like yeah. pumping through your body, and and you're you're crazy. What's the biggest risk you think you you undertook that you even now you would say, well, if my kids did that, I would just. Uh, I mean, I know <sighs> just that, the 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 the, 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 tra- the lines. Trains, train lines, yards, mm. um, hiding from trains. I mean, we do, I remember we'd do track sides and the train would pull up because they'd saw us and stop there. And, yeah, just hotness like that kind wow, of thing. Wow, brazen. Yeah, yeah. Um, running think... down the tracks, crossing tracks, in front of people, that kind of stuff. So it was mainly to do with the train lines were the riskiest thing. I didn't do like high spots Mm. or bridges, hanging off bridges and stuff like that. I never did that. Yeah, it wasn't that kind of time, was it? It was was a lot more... It was more just based around trains Mm. or streets uh, and track sides. Mm. So, so, yeah, I guess that time, it's like you're you're kind of trying to find a way of expressing yourself and you're, you're just wild and you're a teen and... Peer pressure. You feel like you're invincible, I yeah. guess. And there's a lot of other people around you doing the same thing as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's a, such a... And the buzz you get from it. Mm. it, it was Endorphin just, hit. Yeah, yeah, it was a buzz. It was a rush. And that's... Th- I guess that's what separates you from... Like you were saying, there's so many people that had tags back then. But, yeah. But that's what really... 
if you had a, a drive and a slight level of ADHD or whatever, you know, you, you're going for it. Well, I guess some people didn't do trains. Mm. Some people only didn't even get past tagging in their books. So it was a different, like, I guess the hierarchy was the people who did the trains were were the real deal. Mm. I mean, it, it even now, you can, even now for me now, I, I stopped graph in 88 and I never really followed it at all so I didn't see the styles develop I didn't see what came after I didn't see all these killer writers who are still around now Mm. doing these amazing pieces Uh, what really buzzes me is the illegality the illegal side to it Mm. the the, The whole subculture within that yeah and the bombing and why are people taking Mm. these risks Mm. to do this stuff for, for no money and the wildness and the the the, the kind of anti-authority mm. side to it, mm. the freedom. You you don't go at that doing a nice little wall on a Sunday. It's no, a, no, no, it's a no. different thing, isn't it? Yeah. So there were there were there were always two kinds of writers. There were the pieces, the people who were good style, yeah, and they were really good artists. Mm. But then there were the bombers, who were just like people like Ten Foot, who were still going. Yeah, Ten Foot. Who were just really really getting their name everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's a classic, it, classic technique. It's a classic style from a classic hero, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, I, for, for me, the, the people who could do both were the top writers. Dangerous. So if they, could, if they were doing illegal stuff, trains, but they had style, they were the, they were the best. Mm. So it didn't matter how good your pieces were in your, in your piece book mm. or on a wall. You mm. could do. You could take your whole day to do that on the yeah. wall. It was how can you rock a train? <laughs> you and a even train now, train. it's like I really get a buzz seeing stuff on trains, mm. and like it could be the most amazing, intricate, wild style on the wall, and yeah. it's like yeah, whatever. Yeah, it I doesn't, feel you. It doesn't buzz. It doesn't give me a buzz. It's like street art. Yeah, it's completely like. But when you uh, see it on a rolling train, train, it's, it's like, that energy. Yeah, and. You you know what's gone behind it. You know what you've had to do to get to that. Well, you do. <laughs> you <Yeah>. do. <laughs> I might add at this moment. Do not try that at home. All right. You know this is uh, you know this is the, the the guidance here. This is purely for uh, storytelling purposes. Um, and it's like and the punishment is so severe now mm. here for trains. I know a lot of writers. I saw a couple of interviews, and people were saying they go to Europe. To do trains because it's yeah. just it's just impossible here. So that's even more respect for the people doing the trains. Here. Dangerous ways Jesus. and levels, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Um, the, the the hotting up that maybe was installed at the start of uh, uh, of graffiti as a journey. It's funny, isn't it? How authorities take that the opportunity to. It's almost like cruel to be kind levels of of security. And if you breach it, if you get killed, it's your problem. It's like when you were saying at the start of it all you know trains would slow down and wait for you to just get yeah and get out and like press the horn or whatever yeah. right when we right next to us because they don't want anything happening to you right, yeah maybe yeah. there's a different attitude now it's protection of their property well and it's all about property ownership yeah and control and and a visible loss of control so if they're seeing that their trains have been taken over yeah by little vandals yeah it symbolizes more crime or mm. that they've lost control the broken window effect sort yeah of. Yeah, I know some, I mean, even my ex was saying that her friend, you know, in, at Christmas when a load of writers did Oxford Circus, they did the actual stations. Like it rings bells. Through COVID. Yeah, it rings bells. They did a load of, they broke into Oxford Circus, yeah. they did all the platforms and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was saying, oh God, the, it, through COVID, the crime must be going up and up because look at all this. It kind of, to, pe- to normal people, that it symbolises that... A lot, well, a lot of normal, a lot of people. It's sim- graffiti or tagging, or it symbolises that there's more crime, the crimes in the area, or crime is going up, that they the authorities can't control it. You're into the criminology side that's of things. Broken that's broken windows theory. The broken window but there thing. is a point to it, whether the punishments obviously don't work and the prevention measures measures work to an extent. You have got your CCTV. Mm. Um, that kind of stuff, but the other argument is well, it, it it 
it's just displaced somewhere else. So people will just, wherever they're trying to control it, it'll move somewhere else kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. But, yeah, that's all really part of the criminology. Point. But London and the UK especially, because of the governments and because of this country, mm. as a country, mm. it's way more kind of harsh and punitive yeah. with the punishments than may, maybe New York's the same now. Yeah, it's gone but that way. It's it's to I think it's just to show an image of the state in control, yes, isn't it? Or that's the authorities all it is. in control. We don't want to lose be seen to be have lost control. And do you think re- receptively that the, the graffiti writers or graph writers that do the, the more criminal based damage like that, do you think there is a an upstanding of we can do it and get away with it, so you know, fuck you. There is that, isn't there? It's almost like a tit for tat. It's kind of a game, maybe mm. a little game that let's how, see if we can get away with it. Yeah. And I've got one up. Mm. Uh, yeah, which is which we kind of had when we were teenagers or whatever. Mm. We were like that. Mm. We we're like fuck, fuck them. Yeah. Like yeah, let's see, see how much damage yeah. we can do. There, and that is part of the that's part of the course of graph, isn't it? Yeah, it is van. We are we were vandals, but we were artists as well, and vandals, and loads of other things. But it was, so, but it's also yeah. a, a, a class mentality, isn't it? That if you've got, and now I'm getting to this criminology thing because I know you're you're bang into it. But it's like if you're from a class of a, a background, I won't say class. If you're in a background similar to myself sure similar to you where you ain't getting heard you're not about to go to Tate Modern you're not about to go to Sotheby's with the stuff that you've got how do you how you've got there's got to be new routes into a creative arena hasn't there yeah well it doesn't even have to be creative it's about being heard yes so it's like yes graffiti is just saying I'm alive yeah I remember in if you've seen bad meaning good, yeah, yeah, hold tight, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, scam not says it perfectly. Yeah. He goes, it's to say we exist. It's just we exist. Yeah, yeah. It's for people who are unheard, yeah, or yeah. Are, they call them the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, yeah. it's a voice of people of the unheard. Mm-hmm. So it's people, and usually, young people aren't really heard. Heard, yeah, yeah, and young people from. Ethnic, different ethnic backgrounds or from poor backgrounds, even though a lot of writers were from middle class backgrounds, mm. it was just a way, a voice of, of being heard. Solidarity as well, in a way. Yeah, like a gang, I yeah. guess, being you're, uh, accepted from your peers, yeah. getting respect from people you respect that you don't get from your family or whatever, mm. that kind of thing. Mm. Well, that's for me, it was anyway. You were the first person to get bagged for graft. Yeah, in 86. In the country. Well, to get sent to prison. Madness. Yeah, 86. Madness, I mean, you know what I mean? This is... Which at the time, it was just, fuck, this, what's going on? But now, looking back on it, it's a bit of kudos. <laughs> it is, it is. It's like, what was my dad's going to kill me is now become like, I'm kind of celebrated in a sense that, that I can actually say, I was a, I got a friend called um, Rob, he was the first person that got done for pulling off the Mercedes thing and using it as a Beastie Boys. Oh, wow. Wow. He was the first guy. He was actually in the newspaper and everything. Oh, wow. I mean, that's kind of another bit of kudos, isn't it? You know, yeah. You know, of that era. But, yeah, right. I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one, it, was, it was one of those times, wasn't it? What was it like to have been under that sort of pressure and spotlight? What do you mean for... For go, and getting sent down? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my, obviously my parents thought I was mental. They wanted me to see a psychiatrist. Because I wouldn't stop, I came out and kept doing it. Mm. But the actual, the actual place we meet, it was me and Tilt, and um, we got sent to Hollisley Bay Detention Centre. Uh, so they called it Holiday Bay because it was the mm. most, the easiest detention centre. It was really? open, <laughs> so you could escape, but everyone that escaped got caught. Mm. It was kind of on the coast in Ipswich. Um, and you could smoke in there. It was the only detention ah. centre you could smoke. But um, wow. the worst part of that, of of the DC, was the PE. So, the, like, every, you'd have to do circuit training every oh, day. Every day. Mate. So, you mean physical aid? Yeah. So, hardcore. So, the first time you, you went in, the first day you did it, it was probably the most toughest thing of strenuously physical thing I've ever done. A boot camp. Was, yeah, like boot boot camp. So you do a circuit 
So it's different ex different exercises for each going around, and you do one circuit. And the the first time you do it is called the green circuit, the easiest circuit. By the end of your sentence, you're doing three times as much at red, so like much mad. worse. And it's and you're like this. I could do it no problem. Ain't but that something? It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. It's like if you and what I got out of that was like if you can if you put your mind to to something mind over matter yeah. it, you can get through it oh fuck yeah yeah All you day. can get yeah, through yeah, it yeah. Your, your body and your mind can withstand a lot uh, yeah. a lot and those screws were like nasty to you really? they I, they'd hit people as they were going around because people were people were puking up and giving up and stuff like that passing out yeah 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 don't blame them so that's an impact to the body so it was almost like this if you if you can get through this you can get through anything so, so in a way, it was kind of good. Yeah, and I remember Tilt going, "Yeah, a bit of bird does you good." <laughs> yeah, but Big that up bird, tilt. not just twenty four hour bang up. That wouldn't do you good. Yeah, 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 exactly. But it, it almost gave me a bit of. It was a bit of kind of discipline as well as like self discipline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like the army. You get up. You had to fold your kit in a certain way. Mm-mm. Make the bed pack stand to attention, mm. like. March everywhere, polish your boots, all that kind of stuff. Shine your yes, shit. Yes, sir, no, sir. Everyone's yeah. heads were shaved as they went in. Really? It was proper, like, take away any individuality. So you were and all rebuild a you. number. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and kind of break, try and break you so you come out uh, a more disciplined person. But it had the opposite effect to most people. What did they, they came out and reoffended. Really? So it never worked, so they banned it. Because the short, sharp shock, it was called, mm. it, most people would re-offend afterwards. It didn't, you, you kind of built them up to be even bigger and better than before. You could run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could run away this time. <laughs> yeah. So it was, yeah, I mean, looking back on it, I, don't, I kind of thought there, must, there was something good I got out of it, the self-discipline and knowing that you can get through shit. But it was pointless in, in a deterrent. It, mm. it, didn't, it had no deterrent effect. Mm. Or uh, yeah, it didn't work. So, so we after that, I came out and did it even worse. Like just went wild. For how long though? For another what two For years? A couple of years. Yeah. yeah. So that was eighty six. So till eighty eight as coma. Fuck's that sake. was when I really kind went of went in. Yeah, as coma. Resistance was off. You were going for it. Like it uh, was almost like I need. They made me it, the authorities and the state made me more resentful and angry towards them by doing that, by, by sending mm. us to to prison and putting you through this. Mm. Shit. It's like they created these little army warriors to come back out and yeah. fucking yeah, give yeah, it yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, you, you, I think as a, as a graph writer, the one thing that you can, you know, credit yourself for is that you can be pretty nimble at Krypton Factor. And if you're able <laughs> yeah. to be shown the ropes of how to do things and your boot camp in it and then you've got all these... You know, you're ready to roll, aren't you? Yeah. Do you think it's a Do you think it's a common trait that um, that people that offend? And you know, again, sticking to the criminology side of things. That's good. Pe- people that offend, do they? Do they? Is is there? Is it in their DNA to reoffend? Is 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 there something more deeper? And um, is there a more deeper um, element working inside that? You know, bereavement. You know, family. Well, I guess. You know, it it all depends on the individual, but most most people I most people who are in prison are from the poorer backgrounds or have mental illness, mm. so or have fucked up lives. Yeah. So that's kind of says it. It's like you don't really get the 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 the, the privileged, well educated middle classes mm. going to prison, but there some of them are just as criminal. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but apart unless they get done for fraud or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's just it's what they say: the rich get richer and the poor get prison because they just can't facilitate. No, you know, poor people cannot be seen by the doctor as immediate as maybe you know at, at, at the higher classes yeah. can. Things like that. Right? And there's less help mm. for them, or they've got more troubled backgrounds, or drugs play a part. Mm. Um, it's definitely a, a, a bit of na- the nature nurture thing, mm. a, t- a bit a bit of both. Mm. There are people, so you've got say brothers in a family. One of them ends up 
going to prison, the other one doesn't. And then they say, well, if he can do it, why doesn't he do it? So there are differences in mm. biological differences that might maybe make people commit crime more than others. But most most of all, it's your environment yeah. and and what you what you've got around you. Yeah. What, what's going on in your life, your family upbringing, yeah. people you're hanging out with, that kind of stuff. There's loads of different things. It's a real... So and what do you say is crime? I mean, yeah, what was true. crime here? Uh, say smoking in a public place wasn't a crime, I don't know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Now it is. Drinking on the bloody tube is now a crime or something. Yeah, yeah. And it never used to be. Wearing a mask, things like that. Yeah, so there's different crimes. The the, ver the nature of crime changes depending in what the time and the place as well. As a criminologist, criminologist do you think it's fair to say that people that um, have been tried for a crime that now c could be seen as okay, do you think it's fair that they should be still inside for the thing that they commit? Like, for instance... Decriminalising weed, for instance, in the States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot yeah, of people yeah, yeah, have yeah. gone in for that. Like, a lot of people have gone in. Do you th it should be only fair that they get released, surely. Of course. And it's, it all... It's, America's really different, though, to here. It just... It all depends on the state. Mm. So each state has its own laws. So in one state, weed could be decriminalised. The other state, you could get sent to prison for it. That's how varied it is. Bonkers, it's isn't it? It's just weird, isn't it? Yeah. But there's no way, of course not. You shouldn't, uh, with cer certain things that most people would think mm. aren't damaging to other people or morally, mm. should be fine. I mean, mm. I, they put way too many people in prison in this country and in America mm. that shouldn't be. But Full it's stop, yeah. it's all political. It's all it's all it's like, money I th with the private ones. Mm. But it's it's about vote winning. So the 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 government need to be shown. To, to be shown that they're tough on crime because mm. the public want that mm. and the media kind of fuel that. Mm. And so it's like this vicious circle. But self-serving to people that, have, you know, that, that can invest money into those systems that can keep people in jail as well. Yeah, that's the... the uh, it's a lot worse in America, I think, that yeah. the private prisons and the prison, com prison industrial complex. Mm. But here, it's... There's, there's no... It's not about stopping crime or making society better mm. it's about how do we get votes how do we get elected mm. it's the public don't know any the public just get what they're fed from the media mm. so the media needs to sell 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 or get likes or mm -hmm. sell papers or whatever mm. so they're gonna make out crime 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 is bad these people are bad these people the public are gonna believe it and so the government need the public's vote so that the government are going to be tough, tough, tough. Mm. Even though it doesn't work, mm. it, might, it might not work. So the whole thing is yeah. just wrong. It's not real. It's just all about power. Power. Yeah, rather mm. than making society better mm. or stopping crime. Mm. But on the good thing, crime has come down for the last 20 years crime in the whole of the Western world. It's funny you it's say come, that, yeah. It's come down. I've noticed, um, I think, I can't remember what programme it was I watched, but something similar to this is like, I think it's, it's because it's so, it's exercised that people post and retweet and share content and you see all these crazy horrible things that are happening, but it is going down, isn't it? It's just more documented, yeah. yeah. So in the, throughout the Western world, yeah, it's, crime has been going mm. down. But I think through COVID, it started to go up again. Like I saw a program in, about the Bronx in New York mm. and how there's so many more people doing heroin. The crime has just gone Shut a lot up. higher. That was just the last year, though, last yeah. couple of years because of COVID. But before that, it's and no one knows why. Mm. No one knows why. There's loads of different theories, like things like even like abortion have since so. Before abortion, there might have been a lot more unwanted kids who would go off the rails and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But now, and even things like lead in petrol, their theories of since they took the lead out of petrol, crime has gone down. Really? Yeah. But like I think the butterfly effect almost. Yeah, but I think it's to do with people have just become a bit more better off materially, generally everywhere. But the, so the focus is more on the, the new age materials and phones and shit like. That. I guess there's well, a lot more distraction. More of a distraction of consuming on your phone, isn't it? Yeah. And it's the adult pacifier. <laughs> it's like you're just 
you're yeah. just pacified. Yeah, yeah. Or all, yeah. The, all the young person's babysitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me the iPad, quick. But we are, we're, we're breeding people into this, aren't we? But, yeah, that's a whole other thing that, yeah. Um, but with, with, with the foam now, you don't need, everyone is policing each other. That's right, doing so, the job for them. Yeah, so when anything happens, you know everyone's out there with their phones, yeah. like filming it all. Yeah. It's like you don't need CCTV. We now everyone is so like policing each other that Police we're state. all controlling our behaviour because yeah. we know someone can film us and that. That's how that's yeah. that was predicted by this French guy Foucault. For real, Foucault is a like a French philosopher. How do you spell that? F O U C a U L T. Let's check with Bullsy. Let's check with Bullsy. Let's check with Bullsy. No, <laughs> into a bit of Foucault on the yeah, podcast. Come on, I mean, this is very rare that we <laughs> get all these words today. There'd be different little forms of controlling people that would make us affect our behaviour. So we'd be control. Everyone would be controlling themselves because. Have you heard of the Panopticon? Talk to me. So the Panopticon was this tower. It was originally just a tower for a prison where the the guard at the top could see how the prison... The prison was built in such a way around the tower that the guard at all times could see in everyone's cell. <gasps> so when you know you're being watched, mm. you're, adju- you're, you're going to adjust your behaviour. So, La- uh, lab rats. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't, he didn't need to do anything. Everyone just controlled their own behaviour because they know they were being watched all the time. So it's a psychological effect so, of like them knowing that... So that has, in this, now in this society, you can see it with the CCTV everywhere, mm. with things like open plan offices, uh, the, the trains so you can walk all the way through. Everyone can see everything. So you're more wary of you know right i can't do anything space wrong because someone might see me wow so that's that's where we're heading that's where we've got mobile phones are just another form of that that's like the ultimate form you all snitches Every, see every one of us filming everyone else yeah it's like you don't need police no 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 we're <laughs> yeah. all snitches for, you know what i mean all of a sudden it's like, what, what are we doing without a mask it's like that silly kind of this <laughs> the, yeah so it's kind wow. of heading towards like george orwell yeah shit. for sure Demolition man. Unless people do something about it. Yeah. But everyone just is so distracted by their bloody phones. Yeah. No one gives a shit. Bro, I looked in the back end of my Instagram, and that's just one platform, and I saw the hours in which I was on a day. Apparently I do, at the moment, I'm aiming to change, an hour and 56. On the phone? On Instagram That's probably, alone. oh, on Instagram On alone. just Instagram. That's my be Because people probably do much more. You reckon? Yeah, but... Um, Obviously, it's good and bad with the Instagram, with the graffiti. Mm. I think Instagram's got a lot to do with the everyone wanting to look at the old graph photos mm. and the graf- the graffiti mm. thing. There are a lot of ri- old writers who've got Instagram accounts, mm. people posting up old stuff. And it, it's good for culture yeah. or looking at old stuff. Yeah. But then you've got that whole narcissistic selfie crap that. Mm. With the DJs all just DJing behind, dancing behind the decks and stuff, where they just get just for likes kind of thing. Yeah, that's the bullshit side of it. Yeah, but substance has <laughs> suddenly disappeared. It's not. It's not really about that. Yeah, in, it's not about quality or the, it's about look at me. Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And again, back to and that the, yeah, self-serving sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, and it uh, yeah, it's about the self mm. rather than a, a culture or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, and uh, you know, moving on actually to to your career as a the the the, the bona fide path that kind of set precedence from the graph, right? That you yeah you went into well, the music. Well, because I can't because of getting caught and be, and then knowing I was going to get sent to prison again, I kind of stopped anyway. I thought, mm. well, this I can't carry on illegally. Mm. But, but how old it, are you around that time? What was the age? Uh, 20. 20. 20. Still young. Still at yeah. home, probably. I think, yeah, still yeah. living at home, yeah. All those things. So I, that I lo- Yeah, my last piece was in, eight, yeah, yeah, I was 20. Wow. So um, I kind of, it gradually came to a point where I'll, I lost interest or I didn't want to do anything illegally, so I mm. couldn't really 
I didn't want to do walls. Mm. I just because you went against the you know, what you yeah, were into. Yeah, it was yeah exactly. It wasn't mm. I wasn't a particularly good style. I, I mean, I only it took me three years to get good, and that was the best bit, the journey mm. of, of of getting to a stage where I I'm actually got good style now. Once I got good style, that was it. I gave up because you'd already got that's it. <laughs> it was it, loads of factors because I didn't want to get caught mm. because I couldn't do trains again and and because Acid House came along as well. Mm. So it was like you took I took an mm. ecstasy in '88. And then you know, no looking back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, there's there were, a... and there was an there was a the, the graffiti got dark as well. So mm. not only were we getting robbed by tape tone, but some writers were robbing other writers, and there was a lot of crime going on in like eighty seven, eighty eight. Mm. I remember I went to the Public Enemy concert oh, yeah. in Hammersmith. And yeah. got robbed there mm-hmm. in the concert. Yeah, I remember this. this so, been told before. and I know that people were steaming the trains afterwards. Yeah. So it, it just got not dark. Mm. Acid House came along. Everyone was peace and love, hugging you, and it was all love. <laughs> that was all hate. So, yeah. it was just bye, hip hop. See you later. <laughs> so, but I, after Public Enemy, I didn't really listen to hip hop anymore. Mm. I stopped listening to hip hop. Just was like because because of the attitude in the scene. You felt it was just too not because not I'd like... moved into this acid house scene mm. and it was ecstasy and uh dance music. Mm. And that once you've list once you take an ecstasy and you listen to dance music for me anyway, I was hooked mm. on the music. It would kind of goes hand in hand. It was like that 120 BPM four to the floor and you just get in a groove yeah. And it all kind of works with the E. Totally. Don't think it don't get you because like I'm I'm <laughs> I'm as hip hop as the rest of some of you lot. And I, I swear to God, I've been to raves of a time where I really couldn't have seen myself doing it. And I'm like, yo, it's all an environment thing. You've got yeah. to be in it. Yeah, yeah. Mad. If you're in it and you're on the drugs yeah. with everyone else, yeah. it is it's spiritual. Total game changer. Yeah. It's 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 almost like religious you're having a spiritual experience when everyone's coming together mm. all on the same buzz under the same with the dj's a bit like a shaman type mm. thing he's he's performing and you're all together it is religious i guess yeah, it yeah, is yeah. A, it's a religious form. movement and so when that you there's no turning back from mm-hmm. that at that age and i was into music anyway um and um so I, I I kind of channeled that creative energy mm. towards music instead of graph. Mm. So I started buying records. I got a job when I came out of prison as a messenger. So I had a wage every Friday. So I'd go to um, Red Records. It was in Beak Street in Soho. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I'd go there every Friday, buy up records. I'd take trips to New York to get records. What's a messenger though? What is Just a messenger? Just a foot messenger delivering things. That's so, so cold. It okay. was a, it was, yeah. So you know like bike messengers or yeah. cycle couriers. Yeah. So it was just a foot one. So it Stop it. So it was a printing company in Victoria and they most of their clients were architects. So I'd have to twice a day or sometimes in between take the prints that they these huge prints for architects yeah. to the architects pick up their what the next lot they want take it back. So I that, that was just that walking around all day. Yeah. So I'd just listen to music all day on, on a Walkman and just walk around all day. That's <laughs> bonkers. A foot messenger. I'd never even have heard of it before. This is I like... don't know if they have them anymore. No. There's a story that there's a story of, I've heard uh, about the Old Grey Whistle Test. Mm. Now, the, the, the theme behind Old Grey Whistle Test is, of course, the programme that we know as the BBC. But back in the day, a lot of uh, the houses of, of music in the industry was in, um, was in uh, Soho. And what they used to do, the producers of the music, they used to open the windows in the morning and pump out the music really loud for people to hear. Old Greys were old um, soldiers from war that were too old to go to normal jobs, so they became posties. Okay. And they were called Old Greys. Old they used, Greys. Yeah, and they used to walk around Soho. And what they would do is they'd hear the music. And if you hear the Old Grey whistle off he goes, 
It's the old grey whistle hit. test. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's yeah. amazing. So when you were talking yeah. about the messengers, I thought, oh, it reminded me of that. You know, old like, grey whistle test. Yeah, of that era of, like, messengers and sending and, you yeah. know, that kind of era of music and <laughs> shit. Crazy. Basically, it was just a courier, but on foot. Yeah. So I'd just deliver things and pick things up. So sick. Um, but it gave me a chance to just listen to music all day, mm. walking around. So it kind of, I got into buying music uh, every Friday with my wages or whatever, getting two decks mm. and then DJing from so, there. So it was a, it was to facilitate the bigger idea of like getting out there and DJing. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I started DJing in 89 straight mm. away. Got mm. my first gig at a place called The Crazy Club, which was at Busby's on Tottenham Court Road. It's no longer there. And um, it was on a Sunday in the daytime. So people would be going out raving all night and then they'd carry on coming to this place. They'd been, they'd, it, was, it was like an after hours, but they started Definitely in the, the rave daytime. Era, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Definitely the rave era. <laughs> so I got my first gig there and then they, the crazy club did, um, they did the Astoria, they took over the Astoria on a Saturday night. So I used to play in the bar. I never played in the main room. So in the main room would be people like Fabio and Groove Rider, Ray Keith, those guys. Before drum and bass, though. So they'd be playing kind That'd of hardcore, hardcore yeah. maybe some harder house stuff. Mm. And I'd play in the, in the back room. So they, that was my first kind of gigs. And wow. then I'd do the odd gig here and there. There was another club called Sign of the Times, which was more fashion. Fiona, she had a shop in Kensington Market, no longer there, mm -hmm. which was like a place where punks, goths, uh, rockers, all these different youth cultures would could go and buy clothes and stuff like that. Wicked. Yeah. In and Ken it's not there no more. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. So I used to sell my tapes, disco tapes, that I disco that I got from New York there. And so she started giving me, she used to put on parties and she's she gave she gave me a few gigs at her parties during the nineties, and then I and I wasn't DJing regularly though. Mm. It wasn't until I did my first record was, and that's when it all started kicking off as a career, I guess. That's some interesting having Steam on. Big up to you, obviously Drax uh, and and. A few others of the time, yeah. They cite that era, like you're saying, the, the, the mixtape culture, the rave, the acid house. That this was a real kind of transitional thing for a lot of writers. It's almost like they put the cans down, and all of a sudden, like, did they? Do you think they recognised you as being that one of the go-to people of the time? That was actually a writer as well. You know that you were in the scene, or did you keep your? Yeah, it was separate, really. Really, I know because I didn't really hang out with any writers that much then mm. um casby me and casby are still into music a lot of music mm. so he we do re-edits we've put stuff out and sick we always play music to each other mm -hmm. so it's kind of good we've got like similar tastes mm. but no, no other writers were into that i know i saw drax had posted something up about a piece he did around the acid house era mm -hmm. And I know Fuel likes Acid mm. and a lot of the Rev, obviously, mm. Rest in Peace, Rev, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Harvey. Harvey, so it's Harvey, Chucky and Rev. They wow, were, they, you're throwing names right now. They, right? They, were, they were kind of the writers who were doing, like, good parties. Yeah. I went to, I think they were called the Bash Street Kids uh, parties, some of them. Then they became Tonka. Comments below, comments below, you know what we're doing here. Yeah, so they were Bash Street Kids. Drax was probably part of that involved with all that stuff wow. I don't he'd have to correct me but um Harvey Chucky and Rev would be the well, Harvey wasn't really a writer but Chucky and Rev Chucky, were, yeah, fuck that. and they were putting on parties so I would go now and again to hear them but for me Harvey was my favorite DJ he'd be cutting up breaks and then he'd get got into disco and then house and to this day he's the Don he is still the Don He's a superstar DJ now, Boy. but he still always plays music that no one else has got. That's the, that's the whole point, yeah. isn't it? And and good luck to him. He's done really well, mm -hmm. and he's got that kind of attitude, and he's got charisma and all that. So he's done. Mm. He's like a superstar now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. I used to hear him play cutting <laughs> up bloody breaks. I love that, and <laughs> yeah. I love that you say Fabian Grieve Rider were like hardcore rave because we forget about these. Gym. They played house. Yeah. 
So I've got a tape from Kiss FM when Fabio and Groove Rider were playing the house. Yeah, yeah. Like, bad, yeah. I mean, so, the old, old tapes yeah. back in the day with the flyers that were actually the inlay cards and shit. That was yeah. how I used to consume that stuff. And I remember yeah. like DJ Psy and Rat Pack. And, but then there was, there was Jumping Jack Frost, there was Shy FX, there was there Those was guys, Fabian LTJ Bookham, yeah. Ray Keith, those guys. But it went on that drum and bass thing like, like they became. It, it, was, it was hardcore and jung, maybe yeah. proto-jungle. <laughs> and kind of so like Belgian R&S stuff, mm. uh, some of the darker New York mm. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Breakbeat. Yeah. That breakbeat at house tempo. Mm. Were you into but that? I hated that stuff Did actually. You? you hated it. I, I was more into the trendy kind of Italian house stuff and New York. More jackier stuff. Yeah, a bit more American and l- n- not really the British stuff. Mm. I mean, I like the early house. I actually put a compilation out of early UK house stuff and acid mm. um, on Strut, mm-hmm. which. People like I used to really like strut, Evil, awesome. Evil Eddie Richards, yeah. Kid Bachelor, Harvey, um, Weatherall, Andrew Weatherall. Andrew these, Weatherall yeah. these were my favourite DJs, and they played like just quality underground music, mm. kind of houseier stuff. They weren't really playing the hardcore or or the jungle. No, it was a mood. It was a mood, wasn't it? Yeah, I guess they, it kind of branched off uh, half. A lot of DJs just went down the houseier route, and then and then there was the jungle mm. and drum and which became drum and bass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, so it was like two different things. And I went down the house mm. more into the house stuff. Yeah. So yeah, so I guess there weren't really. I wasn't really known as a writer. I'd left all that behind. Yeah. It was almost like I'm just into this now. I couldn't really give a shit about that. Yeah. It's only now that I'm getting. Looking back, it's because you get knocks on the doors like this from me and fucking five twenty one and everyone. It's hello, they got left twenty four as well. Um, I'm, yeah. I might just say because, because obviously there is a creative process to production and one in which you are constantly in the mix with even now. You, you, you yeah, I still make music. You're still making yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. This is what you're doing. Talk to us about that and talk to us about your processes and how that relates in the more general sense of of, of creativity. Right. Well, it is like doing a piece. It's with with uh, the way I make music is I start off with samples, mm. so it could be um, drums from this disco track and a bass line from something else. I might end up replaying it, mm. but that's just the sketches, I guess. The sketch, mm. it's just, and it's almost like that's one color, that's another color, that's another color. How to get Cold. how it all comes together? Yeah. So just create the same similar process. Mm but just with music instead of painting. And I get more of a, I don't know, I get a buzz actually making music. It's like kind of the same that I used to get with Gref. But really? I'll just be at home on my own making Endorphin stuff. Endorphin hits and that's And you're in, it's, you're in the zone. Yeah. You're in the zone and you're creating something mm. and you're just totally into it in that moment and nothing mm. else matters and it's almost like... Yeah, obviously sometimes I, every producer I speak to says, "Yeah, there's a process that you're that you go through. It's like, wow, this is the best tune ever mm. that I'm making. I'm so you're so mm. in love with it. Mm. You come back to it a few days later and go, oh, I don't know about that. That's a bad one night <laughs> stand, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, a bit, <laughs> or that bit is good. That bit shit. Get rid of yeah, that. Yeah, Get rid yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. That keep that. So you're always changing." Um, yeah, so that's how I that's how I am. Yeah, Even yeah. up to now, I'm like, is this any good? I don't know. It's, yeah. It sounded good at the time. But you're meditating <laughs> when you're it's, doing stuff. Yeah, you're, it's, it's almost isn't like it? meditation when you're actually yeah. make in the zone. Yeah, yeah. make in that creative process. You, nothing else matters, time and flies. you're just so into that moment, and you're and you're creating something as well. And that is was like painting a train. Mm. Is Mm. Obviously, you had to be more aware of police and stuff. But, the, but there is this frontal cortex. Okay, here's the science bit, spice alert. But there is a frontal cortex thing with with creativity. People, Beatles mania. How girls can go absolutely nuts over musicians and music. Right. And this yeah. is a real thing, isn't it? Because when you're when you're serving music or serving art to people, it's so immediate. The impact. It's like it stains it's, your head. It's physical. 
in, in and emotional all yeah. at once. You can feel it. Mm. Like women seem to like bass. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. It gets people, women moving yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Wind. Um, and I don't know, the vibrations music that, that make music connect with you yeah. somehow that it can make you feel different ways. Kind of like music <laughs> yeah. can make you feel happy, sad, like yeah. uplifting, whatever, That's right. energy. And you're in the now. They're in the now with you. Who made it? We're all, especially live, of course, and in Clubland. Yeah. We're all on the same vibe. Yeah. And it's invisible. It's yeah. magic, people it's, say. Yeah. yeah. It's, it could be seen as that. And the reason, the reason I like DJing is connecting with people more mm. than... I like making music, being in that zone, but DJing I'm probably better at. And I get more of a buzz even, but what's seeing the react, interaction with the people. For sure. Yeah. 100%. So it's like you get a buzz, seeing them getting a buzz yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of thing. It's like, wow. Mm. But yeah. Mm. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a very good point. Being present. I think that's the biggest fear for the powers that be. Music, I mean, I'm just alluding back to the the, the, the clash of, of of its time, politically charged music. That's like yeah. the and 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 also movement, big cult movements like the Acid House era and and even today, drill. Like that's the biggest threat to government because these are things that are uncontrollable. They're yeah. they're personal, aren't they? And the. Young people will always want that mm. unless we live in this extreme controlled state where they mm. get rid of it. Mm. But it's becoming more and more controlled. You, I mean, it, this isn't, this probably isn't deliberate, but because of COVID, mm. the last gig I did, I had to, I had to show, I had to do the, the lateral flow test, mm. take a photo of it with next to photo ID mm. and then show the photo with the date on it to prove that it was me. Anyone on the guest list had to eat, send all their emails. It was so... It took away any spontaneity... Fun. Or fun. Yeah. And then you're getting... Yeah, it... Like, strip search, and well, pra practically, mm -hmm -hmm. in there. It was so controlled. And it's like, I hope it clubs don't go that way. But even if they do... I think it will. There will still be an underground. There will still be people who want to have fun in their on their own terms, yeah. and luckily we could probably still get away with it. There mm. are little cheeky little venues here and there where you get your own sound system, bring yeah. your own bar, have your own little parties. Yeah, we love that. It might go back to that because everything is becoming so strict mm. and controlled. But pe young people will always. I mean, since yeah. whatever rock criminal and roll. justice bill didn't have much of an effect at the time. It's just they fought through it. They fought, carried on fighting, didn't they? Yeah, young people will always want to have a party, and I think this country as well. There's a that culture of yeah. caning it, mm -hmm. like whether it's drinking, <laughs> doing ease, whatever. Yeah. But there's that culture of really of hedonist that hedonistic culture yeah, yeah. in this country. That I don't know. It's hard. I, Let's hope it stays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's hope. Well, as you, as you were talking, it just it just occurred to me that, and as a and as a contender now, as somebody that's constantly putting out music and yeah. constantly expressing himself, you've been a part of the UK street culture scene from the beginning. Right. I, I mean, guess. you know what I mean. From from your history points when you were younger that you mentioned. Yeah. To now. Now. Well. I guess since the mid '80s through graph and then into the rave culture. Yeah. Um, even though I wasn't a big DJ during the rave culture, I was still going to raves and mm. DJing now and again. I wasn't putting music out. Mm. And then through the n late '90s, I did my first track under the name Bronx Dogs with my mate Paul. <laughs> but that was it. Was almost like it was influenced by hip hop, yeah. but not rap. So. We used to listen to the, you know, the death mix, the Bambata, yeah. Jazzy J, yeah, 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 death mix with the MCs going, it's Jazzy, 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 yeah, J, yeah, J. Yeah, yeah. And we'd we'd analyze we analyzed that and see it and found out every single break that Jazzy J used, and so we sampled the MC going, it's Jazzy, Jazzy, and then used all the, the breaks. There was a break by Edwin Starr that was like the main break going through the track. That was our first track under the name Bronx Dogs. No way. Yeah. So it was almost like a homage back to hip hop, 
but it was played in the dance clubs. That's crazy. Harvey actually DJ broke it. So DJ Harvey was the first one to play it, and then people were going mad over it. Um, See, they retraced the elements we, of yeah. the song. Before YouTube, ladies and gentlemen, this is something you, that you literally went in. This was in 1997. Yeah. Find, you, find them yeah. through ear. Yeah, exactly. Mad. So we, we copied what Jazzy J had done. We got them I in. We just used the same breaks. We called it Tribute to Jazzy J. Mm -hmm. And then um, it, it kind of crossed. It, it, uh, it was played in a lot of those b-boy things so the hip-hop guys got into Embraced it, the breakers it, yeah. Yeah. but then at the same time in the dance clubs so even in house and disco we knew disco uh clubs mm. and at that time there was that big beat kind of scene mm. the late 90s yeah, london yeah. was buzzing then. hold tight derek delage my boy dude. yeah big up derek <laughs> yeah, oh, derek. come on we too, can't say big beat and not say his name <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, derek always raves about that yeah 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 totally. so it's, it's like we kind of went back to our hip-hop roots and then I used my uh, Paul was from a hip hop background I was from more house background mm. musically mm. and then we came together and that was the first time I put we I put something out and that's when the DJing started to take off really and I've been making music since so uh, after that I did stuff with my friend Neil under the name Padded Cell and it was dude yeah, yeah I remember padded. this yeah so it was it was a lot darker yeah so we again. We we took samples from disco breaks, yeah. disco samples, but then played like kind of almost like Italian horror style synths so sick. over the top for a label called DC Recordings, which were big from Grove. They were from Grove Lab. Grove. From Grove, yeah. Jonathan Depth Charge. Depth Charge, yeah. What? He was one of the first DJs before I was DJing. So he DJed with Scams Lot with Crew and those guys That's under right. Grim Death. Hold I tight, think. Crew. Hold tight, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, and Nutriment as well was one of those big DJs back then. My mind is blown. There right was now. a <laughs> club called Rockbox that he used to do. Yeah, that Scam was the what I guess took us to a few of those things. One of them was on a rooftop. Scam relays a lot of this in his podcast. So we're just drawing yeah. dots here. This is like all, mad. Of, all of that, I guess, influenced. Is all part of my yeah. de cultural DNA. And it's, it, hip hop is in it. That's it's hip hop's smart. in it, even though I wasn't really into rap, music rap yeah. afterwards, and I don't know anything about hip hop nineties hip hop. Yeah. I know the big names, Pete Rock, Premier, mm. that kind of thing, but I don't. I mm. didn't list, follow it or listen to it. And the it. same with Graf, isn't it? You really Graf, disconnect. Yeah, I have no idea until now. What well, I missed all the DDS on the trains. Uh, those guys, mm. I didn't. I just didn't follow it. I didn't even see much of it. Didn't see even see much. So, of it. Wow. it yeah, it's. I'm. I don't. I don't know. I didn't. I weren't. I didn't get into the hip hop side of it, as in like the music and mm. a lot of the hip hop and writers got into drum and bass because mm. it was like British hip hop, yeah, UK yeah. hip hop. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I just went more into the house and techno international kind of movement in music yeah house music yeah big rave culture yeah. and electronic music what's your so, discography because for those of you so that, much yeah more. i know we're gonna have to put a link aren't we we're gonna put a link of all the uh, from yeah. then to now this it's on it discogs so if you go to discogs.com mm. just type in richard sen you'll see the discography madness yeah i mean yeah it's quite a lot i have remixed people like sugar hill gang mm. Jungle Brothers, Sizzler, and then obviously Brian, and then more kind of other pop artists, Brian Ferry, John Grant, and and then houseier stuff or more disco LCD sound system. Mm, heavy. Yeah. So I've done a lot. Yeah. And I'm still still putting music still doing it under my own name. That's the exciting bit. But um, yeah, it's just that creative thing is similar to Graph. And it all ties in with in. It's all inf it's all part of my. Inf it, it does it because you're in it. You. That's you. That's yeah, your, your, your testament to somebody that can morph your creative output and still hold true to, like you say, that the blueprint of what um, what you feel creative the creative process is. Right, I guess. I'm I guess so. When you I, said about the components, like the ingredients that make it, like yeah. the outline is that it's a. It, that's what I'm kind of get, um, getting at. Is it's still the same the principles. process. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And like with the DJing now, though, 
in London, everyone's a DJ. Mm. It's like everyone you meet, oh, I'm mm. DJ and I'm DJ. And there are so many more people DJing now. And I, I don't know whether they've got that genuine respect for what's come before, for the history. Mm. I've always been into learning about the history. Mm-hmm. It's like a culture, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a cultural thing. Mm. There are a lot of DJs now, more than before probably, because of social media, mm. who just want to get as famous as they can, as yeah. fast as they can. TikTok that shit quick. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a shame. And it's, it's just saturated with all these like wannabes. Mm. But what can you do? <laughs> well, that's what we're here to do. But there are still people who are into genuinely into quality and the yeah. history and, and the culture. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Which is what you're doing, yeah. Yeah, man. It's what it's all about on here, man. And yeah. for those of you that are just being introduced to Richard Coma, uh, then, you know, there's a lot more out there to get involved. I will put all the links and everything in. There is another website as well that you alerted me to that you've set up. Well, I, I've set up an Instagram page just called 1980s London Train Graffiti. Yeah. And that's just dedicated to the 80s. So it's photos of pieces on trains and then of some writers as well. There you some go. Of writers. New platform alert. But I haven't posted up for months, so maybe... I'm basically nicking stuff from everyone's page mm. and from Rocking the City and from Facebook mm. and wh- whoever sends me stuff to put it on there. It's not it's not about any gaining mm. anything out of it. It's mm. just like a, to document it yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as a train scene. Yeah, so there's right. no walls. No big, walls. Big up it. everyone to big up the, the fact checker, massive, the, the awesome B Boy documents as well that's been. B Boy documents. That, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah, he's sent me some stuff. Yeah, man. Serious business. And big up score as well for all the work that he puts in yeah, that level score. as well. Wow. He's still going strong. Yeah. Yeah. Kilo. Yeah. Big up yeah, Kilo. Absolutely. Everybody that's like representing the scene and getting in deep into it, you know. Um, documenting all these important, you know. Yeah, runs. and I think now's the time, isn't it, that people are starting to get interested because in, there's been enough time and the 80s are seen as cool. Mm. But what I, I heard something the other day, from now looking back to the 80s, is like when you're in the 80s looking back to the 40s. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. So, yeah. God forbid anybody that's listening to this in 2030. <laughs> what the fuck are we thinking? What were they thinking? Doing this like, stuff on what? walls and shit, doing on it's trains? Like talking about the war yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> During the war. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure talking about it's the been, war with you, my yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> soldiers. <laughs> thinking, yeah, soldier. Hold tight, soldier. <laughs> Which is saying, coma inside the place. Thank you so Thanks, much, brother. Oh, that was yeah, it brilliant. Was good fun. That was a lot of fun. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what we're doing here. Sharing is caring. And if you ain't sharing, you're in the wrong fucking room. All right? We're out like he was out of fashion, okay? Stay looking after each other. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. We're out like that. Cheers, Rich. Cheers. Peace.